All right, so if you've got your Bible, uh, go ahead and be turning to the letter of Philippians in the New Testament. And uh, the letter of Philippians is, is one of my favorite in the Bible. I've spent a lot of time in this letter. And one of the things I like to encourage people to do is, or a question I like to ask people is, how, how does Philippians... You can really ask this about any book of the Bible, but, but how does Philippians tell your life's story? Because if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this is your story. Uh, it starts off, Paul says, God began the good work of salvation in you, and he'll bring it to completion. And then he talks about how we live out the gospel. And so it's, it's, I find this just to be one of the most incredible letters ever written. And uh, that's inarguable because God wrote it. Uh, but I also just, it's been so meaningful in my life. And I, I trust that you have books or passages of scripture that, that God has used in your life. And so it's a treat for me to get to teach this on my birthday. Um, but if you got your notes, you can follow along. Uh, Paul wrote this probably in the early 60s. He wrote it in prison. So this is uh, one of his prison letters. That, and it literally means he was sitting in a Roman prison cell, chained to the floor or chained to the wall. That would have been a, a rock cave. Not like, you know, nothing like modern prison cells are. Just a, ro- a hole in a rock, and that's where he was as he was writing these things. So you can see the main idea on the notes there is that Paul is encouraging the Philippian believers to live out their lives as citizens of a heavenly colony, as evidenced by a growing commitment to service to God and to one another. The way of life that Paul encourages was manifested uniquely in Jesus Christ. We also see it's on display in Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus. I've used this word before in the past, but what Paul is, is, is teaching us here is something called a cruciform lifestyle. And that word cruciform means in the shape of the cross. And so he's, he's explaining. He's not just saying you ought to live a crucified life. What he's saying is here's what that looks like. Here's how you do that. Because he knew I, if none, if, if, if none of y'all struggle with understanding, he knew I would struggle with understanding. And so he, he's writing this so that we would all understand what he means when he tells, tells us to follow Jesus. And so you can, you can look over the outline there. Uh, it's fairly simple. But Philippi is an ancient city, or was an ancient city, even when Paul showed up on the scene. It had been around for thousands of years, most likely, when Paul entered the town, the city, to plant the church. And it's still fairly well preserved today. You can go and, and visit Philippi. It sits uh, somewhat near uh, the coast of the Mediterranean Sea on the northern side of the Mediterranean Sea in, in the area of Greece. And lots of world history happened in and around Philippi. And so it makes sense that, that Paul would plant a church there. As Paul is looking at the world and thinking, where, where are the most strategic places to plant the first churches so that the gospel continues to spread? It makes sense that he goes to places like Philippi or Corinth, these well-established cities that have highways coming through them so that the gospel is heard and keeps going. And so Philippi was just one of those, one of those cities. Um, a lot of people think Philippians is about joy. It's a letter about joy, and it is. There's, there's, there is no lack of joy in Paul in the letter of the, to the Philippians, but it's, that's not really the primary emphasis. The primary emphasis is humility, that he is... He is writing to this church to look to Christ, who is the premier example of humility, and then for us to then live out what we see in, in Jesus Christ. Um, if you're interested in archaeology, which I like knowing as much as I can about the culture and the context and stuff that was going on around when Paul was there, but what they, some of the things they have unearthed in Philippi is it was, it was a good thing to tell people how good you were. So the higher you were culturally, the, the better, and the more you could brag about it, the better. And so some of the things they've unearthed in Philippi is that it was a common practice to like on your mailbox or the entrance to your house, you would put up all of your titles. So whatever you had earned in the way of the world, you would put that up so that when people would come into your home area, they would know, okay, this is a very prestigious person. 
And the more you could say about yourself, the better your standing was in Philippi. And so in the context of this Roman colony that was super proud of being proud of themselves, Paul writes this letter about being humble. So that, that makes it even more important that we get the topic down, that this proud people Paul is calling to humility. And so we're just going to follow right along with how Paul writes the letter because it kind of it builds on itself. So right off the bat, what we notice is that there is a distinct and good relationship between Paul and this church, which we can't say that about every church, right? With the, with the Corinthians, it was more of a, a, a tense relationship. He had, to, he had to write back to them and give them verbal spankings several times. Uh, he had been criticized over his appearance short and bald and didn't really speak good in person with the Galatians. He had to kind of smack them upside the head and say, you guys are being foolish, wandering off into myths. But with the Philippian church, he starts off in verse 3. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. And they had a deeply mutual, uh, a deeply loving relationship. And it went both ways. And so the time that Paul spent in Philippi was very good. It was, he, he liked being there. And if you remember when we went through the book of Acts, uh, the New Testament is not chronological. So Acts didn't, you know, it's not Acts and then Romans and then Corinthians. Uh, Acts is a history of kind of the whole New Testament period. And so in Acts 16 is the historical record of when Paul comes to Philippi and meets Lydia and starts to plant the church there. So you can kind of read about what happens, and he goes through a pretty extensive period of suffering there uh, and is beaten uh, because of his ministry. But you can read about kind of the historical background of Paul in Philippi. But as the church is planted and the church grows, they become to, they come to really love one another. And the reason why Paul writes this letter is that the Philippians have sent Paul money. And uh, that's a big deal. And, the, and the, the reason why it's a big deal is because if you got locked up in a Roman prison cell, you did not get food and water and clothing and blankets unless somebody paid for you to have it. <laughs> so if you got locked up in a Roman prison cell and nobody was your benefactor, you could easily starve or freeze to death, depending on the time of year it was. So the Philippians heard that Paul was in prison, and so they sent money to buy him food or to clothe him or to give him a blanket to be warmed by. And so he you know, was obviously very grateful to receive uh, that, that gift from them. And so he writes back, they send it by this guy named Epaphroditus, which he shows up. So Epaphroditus brings this gift from the Philippian church to Paul. And that's why he writes this, this letter back. So he expresses uh, gratitude for them. Uh, and then he also challenges the church to remain faithful. He's, he's thankful for what they've given him, but he's not going to miss an opportunity to pastor them and to shepherd them. And so he's going to take this opportunity to, to encourage them in some ways. And so he does that as well. And one of the things he tells them is that they're to remain faithful in the face of opposition. And, you know, we're our, uh, let's see, First and 2 Corinthians. This is the fifth letter that we've dealt with from Paul. And they've all had something hard to deal with, Right? That ought to give us some encouragement. That none of these churches were perfect. We're not a part of a perfect church, so we're tracking right along, right? <laughs> that the Romans were struggling over how the Jews and, and Gentiles fit together. Corinthian, the Corinthian church was just broke down altogether. The Galatians were wandering off into some false teaching. Uh, in Ephesians, he, he admonished them to remain unified. And now here, he's saying, look, there's some opposition starting to crop up. You need to stand firm against it. But he begins by giving thanks, <clears throat> excuse me, giving thanks for their partnership in ministry. So look with me if you have your Bible, Philippians chapter 1. I'll pick up reading in verse 1. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants or slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons, or it might say the elders and the deacons. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. 
because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Jesus Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. And so you, you can almost sense this, this very loving, very affectionate, and very thankful expression from Paul as he's writing to this church. Now you can imagine the difference in, in the hearing too, that if, if somebody stood up and read Second Corinthians to us for the first time that was written directly to us, we might be offended the first time. But if somebody stood up and said, we got a letter from Paul and this is how it started, we'd be like, that's right, Paul. We want to hear more like that. And so this is the, Paul really genuinely loved uh, the people of this church. And he talks about how they have been in lockstep together from the first day all the way until now. They have a shared goal, uh, which is to make Jesus Christ known, to see people saved. And he makes that known. And so because Paul loves this church, he prays, he writes this prayer out. And he prays that they would be able to discern what is best. Notice that in verse 9. He says, it's my prayer that your love may abound with knowledge and discernment. Now, this is a common theme. I, I think I mentioned last week that you can't really understand any of Paul's letters by themselves. They're all interconnected. They all build on each other. And last week in Ephesians, he, he gives this, this deep explanation of, of truths about God so that we may know what is, know what is right we may approve what is right, that we might be able to recognize what is wrong. And that's what he says here. My prayer is that your love for God would overflow so much that we would know the right things and be able to discern between right and wrong. Verse 10, the fruit of that is to approve what is excellent. Then the flip side of that is to disapprove of what is not. And so his prayer is saying, because I love you, I want what's best for you, and what's best for you is to know God more so that you walk in the ways of God. And that's a, a pretty fantastic prayer. And so after that, he wants to update them on where he's at. And so he gives this explanation of the fact that he's in prison. He says in verse 12, I want you to know what's happened to me. That means he's in prison, which he said that back up in um, verse 4. I know, verse 5. Nope. Anyhow, somewhere back up at the top, he said he was in prison. Uh, but he's, he's writing back and he's saying, I want you to know this imprisonment is not a bad thing. Because probably what has happened in the church is they've heard their beloved apostle has been arrested and shoved into a Roman prison cell. And they're wondering, is he going to maintain? Is he going to stand up under the pressure? Uh, is the gospel, is this going to hurt the testimony of the gospel is, is, are people going to continue to be saved? And so he's writing back to this church that's worried about him, and he's saying, look, this is, this is really a good thing. I don't, I don't like being in prison. I, I doubt Paul would have said, I like being in a prison cell. But he recognizes that God is at work over and above details. Uh, can, you know, I, I think of uh, Genesis 50 where Joseph, speaking to his brothers, says, what you meant for evil, God meant for what? Good. And Paul has that firmly lodged in his mind, so much so that it's trickling down into his experience. And so he says, look, I, I'm in a bad place. I'm in a prison cell, and I'm here wrongly, but God has big plans, and they're, it's ultimately a good thing. And so he's trying to write some encouragement to them. And he says, even though I'm here, it's really served to advance the gospel. Verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, 
are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, does anybody know the story of what happened when Paul was in jail in Philippi? Does it ring a bell if I say the Philippian jailer? That he's, 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 yeah, he converted him. He was, he says in, in Acts that while they were in jail, they were singing hymns about midnight. And all of a sudden there was a great earthquake. And it was so violent that it rattled, it rattled open the doors. And when the guards saw that uh, all the prisoners were going to escape, he said he drew his sword to, to commit suicide. But Paul says, wait, we're all here. And then he witnesses to him and he's converted. And then you think about Paul, Paul's writing about that. The gospel has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. Why? Well, because I saved a man's life. I was about to, to about to take his own life. I didn't run. I could have run away. I was, a, I was an innocent victim. But I stayed to preserve that man's life. And, and praise be to God, he got saved. And his whole house got saved. And people are becoming far more bold. And so Paul says, don't worry about me being in prison. God's working this thing in some ways that we never would have imagined. God's doing some stuff with this that we never would have planned. And the same is true in your life. I mean, you, you no doubt are facing some kind of situation. And uh, one of my favorite quotes comes from a pastor that says, God is doing 10,000 things a day in your life, and you might be aware of three of them. Paul didn't know exactly what was going on what, what God's agenda was by putting him in jail, but he knew God was sovereignly over every detail, the good and the bad, and that God had a plan, and that sometimes we can't even fathom what God is, is at work doing. Sometimes we can get so bogged down with what's in front of us, we lose sight of the fact that God is in control. And yet what Paul would say is, look, God works miraculously in details in ways that we can't even fathom sometimes. And he does it for his glory. So he's trying to encourage the church, don't lose hope because I'm in, I'm in prison. People are getting saved. People are getting bold. Good things are happening. Like a revival. <laughs> it's a revival right there in the prison because Paul knows God. Now think about the connection there, right? Paul says, because I understand who God is, I have a good attitude about this whole prison thing. People are getting saved. People are getting bold. And that's tied back to what he prayed for them in verse 9. That our love may abound in knowing the right things and discerning the right things and approving the right things. Because if Paul would have gone into, that, gone into that prison cell not knowing God and not knowing the ways of God, then there's no telling what would have happened when the doors rattled open and that guard was about to take his life. There's no telling what would have happened if Paul was humdrum about this whole thing and not having this knowledge of God works even through bad details. And yet he's encouraging this church. In the midst of it, in verse 15, he says, Look, some, some indeed are preaching Christ from envy or rivalry, rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me. So there's, there's people that preach the gospel for all kinds of reasons. And some, of them are, some of them are good, some of them are bad. And instead of getting hung up there, he says, What then? Why? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Y'all ever heard somebody say, I'm not coming to church because of the hypocrites that are there? You know, that's, that's an unfortunate uh, reputation that the church has gotten rightly. Right? Not one of us in here is without sin. Not one of us in here is perfect. Not one of us in here uh, loves God better or more or more effectively. Uh, we are all a group of broken people in need of grace. And there are people in churches that are in church for the wrong reason. There are people in churches that are in churches for the right reasons. And Paul says, look, instead of getting hung up on these details about who's doing what and why, but the, not that it's unimportant, but he said, my attention, my focus is on the fact that the gospel is being heard. Because you know what? I've mentioned several times about the danger of false teachers. And we ought not ignore that. But every so often, false teachers get it right. And God can use 
the getting it right from a false teacher to save somebody. And so Paul says, in whatever situation, if the gospel is being heard, then God can use it and God can bless that. And so he says, don't, don't get hung up on that. And so he knows his imprisonment. He knows false teachers. He knows these other things cannot ultimately threaten God's mission. You know, when, when we aren't knowing God rightly, then sometimes things that pop up in our lives tempt us to believe God has somehow uh, missed, the, missed the ball, dropped the ball. He didn't see this one coming get a, a diagnosis or a bad news or you know, something that, that kind of brings your life to a halt and you wonder, how, how did God not see this coming? And Paul is saying that's, that's not knowing God rightly. Knowing God rightly leads us to see God purposes everything in our lives, even the things that stop us cold in our tracks. Let me read this next section to you because I think it's one of the, the best in all the Bible. He says in verse 19, uh, I know that through your prayers and help of the Spirit of, of Jesus Christ that this will turn out for my deliverance. As is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, for most people, death is, is, is the most scary thing you can face. It's the thing to be avoided at all costs. And yet Paul says, for me to live is to have Jesus, and for me to die is to get Jesus more. Verse 22, he says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. That's better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So Paul is very honest with him. He says, look, given the option, given the option I'm going to heaven. If Jesus says, you want to stay or come on up? He says, I'm, I'm going to come on up. He says, but I also know that God has given me the responsibility, the job, to increase and encourage you in the faith. He says, so I'm gonna, as long as I'm here, I know that my job is to live out the gospel, to enjoy Jesus Christ in such a way that the rest of you all progress in your joy in the faith. I probably asked this before, but you ever been around somebody that the way they love and enjoy God makes you want to love and enjoy God more? The way that they experience God, that you see them, I, I want to experience God that way. That's what Paul's saying. That that's, that's, his, that's his ministry with these people. And so, because he has this right idea of God, that, that nothing can derail what he's doing, he said, I'm, I'm going to live that out in front of you. God's plan doesn't depend on his people being out of jail. It doesn't depend on everyone always being honest, always doing what is right, always getting along. If God's will depended on human characters, it'd be doomed. The best human can't get God's will done for very long at all. Think about Sunday. We looked at Peter uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane denying and running and then in the courtyard denying Jesus three times in the span of an hour and a half the disciple closest to Jesus wasn't able to get it done actually he was <laughs> because it was God's will for Peter to deny him three times Jesus told him in advance and so even when Peter said I won't do that what did he do he still he still did it Paul understands things like that don't don't mess up God's will and so his point is that once we die to ourselves, once we die to try to maintain this idea of maintaining our own lives or being able to arrange the details or trying to figure things out on our own, once that dies in us, which it ought to die, we're really free to trust God. We're really free to, to live a life trusting that God is, in, God is in charge. And so then he kind of moves into the, the body of the letter, which is unity and humility. He says in verse 27, we should let our lives be worthy of the gospel. Not that we are trying to earn it, but because of all that Christ has done in us, we ought to lead our lives in such a way that we honor Jesus, that we make him look good, that we enhance his reputation, that the, the, the standard of our lives should be the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And so he says, when our lives, whether that's a personal personal description or corporately as a church, when we are centered around the gospel, we will stand firm for Jesus. We will stand firm against opponents of the church and of the gospel. And we will have a growing faith. One of the things that, that we can say without fail is that as our culture descends more and more into wickedness, if the church will come to hold this more tightly, our faith will grow. Now, I, I, I talked about this um, sort of been in January when we started the seven letter series. I preached an introductory sermon out of Timothy where Paul says that the church is to be a pillar and buttress of the truth. And I asked the question, why would a church, with everything going on in the world, why would a church devote its attention to making sure leadership is rightly ordered, that people are knowing their Bibles, that people are being discipled, that we're trying to reach the world with the, the message of Jesus Christ? Why would we not be more active in politics? Why would we not be picketing things and, and, and doing you know, social activism sorts of things? Why would we be focusing on things that seem to be ignoring the world. And the reason is, as the world descends into chaos, if we hold fast to the word of life, our faith will increase as the world gets darker. That's what Paul is saying here. When we hold true to the gospel, things will go well with us. And he calls us to be unified. He says, let your manner of life be worthy so that when I come... And see you, or I, or I am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith. Not frightened. Because when the church stands up in the face of its enemies, Paul says that's a clear sign of their destruction. Not ours, theirs. And so he says we're to be unified. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ... Any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and with one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So he says, my, my prayer is that you would be unified, and then further, you should also be unified, and that unity comes through humility. The way that you come together is by counting each other more important. The way that you come together and have one mind, one spirit, is that you look at each other and say, I want, I want your best. I want you to flourish. I want your faith to grow. That's what Paul said, right? He said, if I'm to be here with you, it's, it's for your sake. If God's keeping me here, uh, verse 20, uh, 25 of chapter 1, it will be for your progress and your joy in the faith. That's how you become unified, not by coming up with some shared political agenda or by some social uh, cultural project. It's by saying we want Jesus Christ and we want him together. Now, that doesn't mean that the church isn't going to walk hard through hard things. Look back at chapter 1, verse 29. Paul says, Not only has it been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should believe in him, but also what? Suffer. Right. Now, we know belief is a gift from God, right? How do we know that? I didn't, make it, I didn't make it clear enough last week. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Paul says, By grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. The faith that brings about belief and salvation is given to us from God. And Paul says the same thing here. He says, Not only has it been given to you that you should believe, but what else has been given to us? Suffering. That, that ought to rattle our cage. When we walk through hard things, it's from God. When we walk through hard things, it is from God. And look at how Paul's suffering. Paul's sitting in the prison cell. What is, he, what is he saying? My suffering is serving to advance the gospel. So I don't have time to really... You know, we, we, we ought to develop for ourselves a God-centered understanding of suffering. 
so that when we get a bad diagnosis or when we get a bad phone call or when the details don't go our way, we are reminded God has given this to me. It's an opportunity for the gospel, both in my life and in the lives of those around me. That doesn't make the suffering any less intense. It doesn't make the pain less, but it rightly orients our minds. And that's what he's saying here. Not only do you believe in Christ because God has given that to you, but any hardship you walk through is from God as well. And in the middle of it, be unified. And that unity comes through humility, counting others more important than yourselves. But how is it that we do that? Because we're proud individuals, right? We are proud of ourselves. We want people to think well of us. We want to be thought well, thought of well. But Paul says in verse 5, In order to do that, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not, count as, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the New Testament, Paul writes two what they call Christological hymns or, or Jesus-centered hymns. And this is number one. The other one's in Colossians. But he just he kind of he kind of begins to to wax eloquent about how beautiful, how majestic, how glorious, how perfect Jesus is. And he puts this here for a reason. I like the way one pastor says that he says this is this is an explanation of Jesus for the church. This is not just for us to think, man, Jesus is good. This is for us to say, man, Jesus is good. Now that begins that that that's how I change. How is it that we, that we are going to be unified through humility? It's by remembering that Jesus, who is the perfect one, humbled himself for us. That Jesus, who is God, humbled himself by taking on human form and humbled himself even more by dying on a cross, the most humiliating of deaths, so that we might have life. And if Jesus did that, we ought to do that. That's why in verse 5 he says, Have this mindset or this mind among you, which you can have because of Jesus. Jesus is our supreme example for humility. And then he says, That ought to be lived out in the church. That ought to be played out in the church. Look at verse 12 of chapter 2. Therefore, on the basis of that, he says, As you have always obeyed, now do it even more. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And I think I, I talked about this last week. That phrase, work out, does not mean finish. He's not saying God, God got you 90% of the way there. Now you've got to work out the rest of the 10%. That phrase, work out, means exercise. So go into the spiritual gym of the church and pick up some weights. Do some squats. Curl some dumbbells. Work out. Strengthen your faith together. I think we talked about that phrase, your, work out your. That's a second person plural, which we would translate y'all. Work out y'all's salvation. It's, a, it's a, 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 a command to everybody in the church. Never, never once do you f find Paul talking about an individual Christianity. He's always talking about a together Christianity. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Work out, exercise you all salvation together. But then look at verse 13. He says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for what? His good pleasure. So why does God do things in our lives? For Him. Does it for his will, for his glory, right? We talked about that last week in Ephesians, that, that God's primary goal is to bring honor and glory to him. That the reason why in Ephesians 1, he predestined us for adoption of sons and daughters before the foundation of the world is to glorify him. The reason why he is at work in us is for his pleasure. The reason why we are saved is 
chapter 1, verse 6 of Philippians, is because he began that good work, and who's going to finish it? He is. Because who's in charge? He is. See, y'all got that one. And so Paul says, this, all this humility, all this unity is to be lived out in the church. Knowing that God is in charge, knowing that God is willing His glory through us as His people, he says in verse 14, Therefore do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. He says that humility that we see in Jesus is to be evident in our lives as the church. It's to make itself known, not in general, but through a distinctive practice of being Christians. It's meant to be very tangible in the life of the church. That's why he says, do everything without grumbling against each other. Do everything without arguing over trivial stuff. Be blameless. Think about some of the other things that Paul has already said throughout his other letters about this kind of thing. In Romans 15, 1, he says that the strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. 1 Corinthians 1, he says that we proclaim a message that seems foolish to the world. In 1 Corinthians 5, he says we're to, we are to rid sin from within the body. 1 Corinthians 6, he says we are to settle legal disputes not in the courts, but in the gathered congregation of the saints. In 2 Corinthians 4, he says we're jars of clay. In Galatians 5, he says we are to exhibit the fruits not of the world, but of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1, he says we are to trust God's sovereign control. In Ephesians 4, he says we're to live out the unity of the gospel. And here in Philippians, he says we are to be unified through humility. It's almost like he's, he's doing something. He's trying to teach us that Christianity is not this general, I believe, a certain list of things, but Christianity is a lifestyle that's lived out on purpose. That I'm making choices in my life based on the truth of, of God's Word. And that's why, back in chapter 1, he prays that their knowledge of God would increase so that they would know what is right and discern between right and wrong and come to approve what is excellent according to God. And so he says, live out the humility of Christ. He briefly points to some other examples. He says, look at me. Paul says, look at me. Look at Timothy. Look at Epaphroditus. And then he gives us others in the church. Like one of my job, one of my responsibilities as a pastor is to live in such a way that it makes you want to be a better Christian. So in Hebrews 13, 7, it says, consider those who taught you the word of God. Consider their way of living and the outcome of their way of living, and imitate their faith. It doesn't mean that I'm called to be perfect. It means that I'm called to live out my faith in such a way that it makes you want to imitate it. Same thing with Paul saying, that, that, that we have a responsibility to one another to encourage each other. That's why he says, if I'm to continue, it's for your progress, your joy in the faith. Chapter 3, he tells them that they're to be steadfast, in opposition to false teachings, that that unity and humility is to make them steadfast. Apparently, there's some false teachers that had come into the church teaching circumcision again. This happened in, in, in Galatians. But in chapter 3, he says, look out for dogs. Now, I, you know, I don't know if I could get away with that, calling somebody a dog, but Paul did. If you remember in 2 Corinthians, he says, I'm not very bold in person, but when I pick up that pen and I've gotten some distance, I'm going to write it. Right? So he calls them dogs. Watch out for dogs who want to mutilate the flesh. There were some people in Philippi teaching, in order to be a Christian, you have to believe in Jesus Christ and be circumcised. And Paul says, no, no. That's a false gospel. The true gospel plus things equals a false gospel. The true gospel minus some things is a false gospel. And Paul says we're to, we're to watch out for those Watch out for those false teachings. Um, these teachers were insisting that as long as your outward obedience lined up with the law, you could be saved, which is why they were teaching circumcision. And Paul says in chapter 3, verse 4, he says, if anybody, if anybody has reason to be confident in their outward religious practice, it's me. 
and I'm not. If anybody can brag before God about everything they have done, all the right that they've done and all the wrong that they haven't done, it's me. He said, and I'm not. He said, I came from the right people group. I came from the right tribe within the right people group. I had the, the law memorized. I was an up and comer when it comes to the Pharisees. But in verse 7, he says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He's saying, I, I had a good life going. And I thought I was in good with God because I was religious. I knew the Bible. And I was, I was doing everything I thought I needed to do. He said, but then God opened my eyes, and I realized not only was that stuff worthless, but it was actually keeping me from God. So people who come to church thinking God will be pleased with them for sitting in church, or they read their Bible thinking God will be pleased with them, and, and, and that uh, they give the money because they think God will be pleased with them, or, or whatever they're doing, they think, if I just do these things, God will let me into heaven. Not only is that not working for them, it's working against them. And that's what Paul is saying. That we're to stand firm against false teaching by holding to the truth of the gospel. In verse 12, reflecting on the death and the resurrection of Jesus, he says, Not that I've already obtained this or that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Now there again, he's reminding himself and reminding us, where does salvation come from? comes from God, right? He says, I'm pressing on towards Jesus, not because I chose him, but why? That's right, because he made me his. Galatians 4, he said it this way, he says, now that I've come to know God, or rather, to be known by God. And so he's saying here, any, any progress I'm making in the faith, any passion I have for Jesus any humility that's true didn't come because I wanted it. It came because Christ transformed my life. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it to you. He said, let's just hold true to what we have attained. Let's hold true to Christ. Let's hold true to unity. Let's hold true through humility. And so he says, let's, let's do that. He says, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He said, for many of whom I often told you and now tell you with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. You know, he's, he said something similar in Ephesians. That God is their belly, or they're, they're, they're enslaved to what they want. Ephesians 2, verse 1, he says, We were dead in our trespasses and sins, in which we once walked, following the course of the world, following Satan. He says, Among whom you all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. Apart from Jesus Christ, we are enslaved literally to whatever our bodies and our passions want. He says it here in verse 3, that apart from Christ, our God, our controlling reality is our appetite. Not our physical uh, food appetite, but whatever our body wants. And if you remember... Start to do some theological putting together here. If you remember in Romans 3, Paul says, No one is good. No one seeks for who? No one seeks for God. So Paul says, Nobody by themselves seeks for God, and that apart from God, my passion is my, my belly. That means that apart from God, what I want is everything that's not God. But Paul says, I'm Christ Jesus. Is, I, I belong to Jesus because Jesus came and got me. Jesus came and rescued me. Jesus opened my eyes so that I might see. He who began the good work of salvation in me, Philippians 1 verse 6, he'll finish it. The, my, my, my God is not my belly anymore because God has opened my eyes and saved me from that. He saved me from following the course of the world. 
He saved me from following my passions and my desires and everything that was opposed to God. And so he says, I press on towards Jesus because he's opened my eyes to that. And so in verse 20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. And from heaven, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our bodies, our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So we, we see a lot of brokenness in the world. There are a lot of things that are just broke down and not, they don't work and they're confusing and frustrating. And he says, our hope is not in the world. Our hope is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior. And what else do we await from it? We await the transformation of our lowly bodies, which are breaking down. He says that in 2 Corinthians 4, though my outer body wastes away, he says it here, uh, we're waiting the transformation of this body that's dying. In 2 Corinthians 4, I, I love his language. He says, my outer body, my physical human body is already decaying. My soul is being strengthened. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, I long to put off this tent, this temporary dwelling, and I long to put on the building that God will give me in heaven, that permanent, that permanent body. That's what he says here in Philippians. He says, from heaven we will receive Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. Or John says it like this in 1 John chapter 3. He says, what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. There'll be something about seeing Jesus in that day that will radically transform our bodies. And Paul says it right here. He has the power to do that because he can subject everything to himself. And friends, the Bible just keeps getting thicker. I mean, you just start seeing, whoo, this is all connected. And it's good. And so in chapter 4, he ends with some encouragements. It says, rejoice always. Let your, let your reasonableness be made known. Philippians 4.13 is probably one of the most quoted verses in Scripture and it's often misquoted. It says, I can do all things through, through Christ who strengthens me. But go back up to verse 10. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned but had no opportunity he means that you didn't know where I was in prison, so you didn't know where to send the money, but you found out and you sent it, and I'm thankful for that. He says, but not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. What is that secret he's talking about? Verse 13, he can do it all because of Jesus. Philippians 4.13 is not meant to be applied in whatever situation we want it to be applied in. What Paul means by Philippians 4.13 is he knows how to be content no matter what's going on in life because of what he has in Jesus Christ. If your life is going really well, if you're having one of those mountaintop seasons of life, then don't lose sight of Jesus Christ. And the reason you have the hope of not losing sight is because you can do all things to him who strengthens you. But if you're in a valley season of life, and the world seems to be falling on top of you, Paul says, you can be content in that because of Jesus Christ. And so he finishes in verse 19. He says, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He will supply every need of yours because of his riches. There's nothing that he can't do. There's nothing that you need that he cannot give. There's no need that will go unmet. And so he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in your spirit. Uh, I, hope, I hope that encouraged you. I never come away from Philippians lacking encouragement. I hope you're seeing that the Bible is way deeper. I, I mean, I'm just always amazed at how deep the Bible is every time I come to it at the Lord's ability to speak truth into my life, to connect, to help me see, man, he wrote this book on purpose.
So let me pray for us, and then if you have questions or comments, I'll, I'll be down front. Father God, we, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that it is more valuable than food. Lord, it is the food that we need for our souls. It is the, it is the treasure that we have in these fragile bodies. And Father, I thank you for the reminder that you've given us in Philippians that you began the good work of salvation in us and that you will see it, to, see it through to the day of Christ. Lord, we thank you that you oversee our lives, every detail of it. We thank you that you are at work in our lives to will and to work for your good pleasure. And knowing those things, Father, may we live out the truth of your salvation. May we be a people unified and humble because we serve a humble and risen Savior. May we forget what lies behind and press on to what lies ahead. May our hope be set on heaven, for it is from heaven that we await our Savior, who will transform our lowly broken bodies to be like His glorious body. Father, may our reasonableness be made known to all. May we have contentment in every circumstance not because of any given circumstance, but because you remain the same no matter what's going on in our lives. We know that you will supply every need we have according to your riches in Christ Jesus. And so we know we have the grace of God in our lives. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen.